Hello and welcome back to another World of Warcraft discussion video. So this is going to be the follow-up to a video I released about a week and a half ago, and in that video I talked about just some of the issues that are hampering World of Warcraft at the minute, and how they can sort of just start growing the game again. In the video in particular, I tackled the starter edition, leveling, and a few different topics like that. So if you have missed it, it's essentially part one, and this is part two, and I'll have a link to it in the description. Anyway, let's move on to this video itself, and I'm going to be talking about the endgame of Warlords of Draenor, and just potentially how it can sort of fix and improve things, and in general, just how things may play out during the expansion. And then, depending on the amount of time I have left, I may talk about some business decisions like subscription prices, um, battle chest prices, and various things like that. But anyway, let's jump into the meat of this video and endgame. So, after the last episode's fixes, we managed to get people up to the endgame successfully, and World of Warcraft's endgame has always done a pretty decent job at keeping people busy, though there are definitely some improvements that can be made, and uh, first here are just a few of the things that Warlords of Draenor will have already made better. So first of all, there is the new raid structure of Normal, Heroic, and Mythic, and this really does cater to a lot of people. Having an expansion with the progression starting at Flex, well, the equivalent of Mr. Pandaria's Flex from the outset, is great. In Mists, a lot of people didn't really have a difficulty that suited them, and a lot of those people actually left before Warlords of- or not Warlords, sorry, but, um, before Siege of Orgrimmar released. That is a whole sort of ICC-10 crowd. They haven't really been um, catered to in terms of dif difficulty levels since Ice Crown 10. They had to deal with three tiers of Cataclysm that didn't suit them, and then two tiers of Mists of Pandaria. It was only with Siege that they actually got that difficulty level back. So a lot of those people are going to come back for Warlords, and then they're going to find that the difficulty level that they really enjoy playing at will now be catered for, and that really is kind of fantastic. Also, now that Flex is here, and it's going to be properly kind of fleshed out, um, it, this means that LFR can properly be made the tourist mode the Blizzard have been talking about. Now, before you jump into the comments and rage, I do have a few points to make about this, so actually do wait until you hear my opinion. Um, so yeah, this does mean perhaps less one-hit kill things, Maybe more forgiving mechanics, but I think in general what matters is that, that they design these encounters a little bit more specifically for LFR, and at least the LFR versions that is. The point is that it's only designed for people who want to see the content once and be done with it. That's kind of the point of LFR. Blizzard have said many, many times that the game is better in organized non-match, uh, sorry, in organized, um, yeah, non-match made groups. And LFR is really just best for people who are say PVPers or pet collectors, that basically just don't really care about PvE gear progression. Now you may be thinking, hang on a second, um, LFR has been my uh, my end game. What the hell? With it being easier, um, I don't really get any challenge, right? No, that, that's wrong. There is actually a, quite a few other changes that should help people um, out in this regard a lot. So the group finder system is being expanded upon, and it's going to be similar to some add-ons like OQ. This means that people can cross-realm set up groups for almost anything. And um, having just used OQ to uh, cap Conquest a while back, I can say it's a brilliant system, and then the official Blizzard version of this will help a lot. People will be easily, easily able to pug a flex, and it also gives raid leaders a very easy way to communicate what kind of raid they will be doing, so that it avoids um, people kind of not really knowing what they're getting into. This just means that things should have a lower failure rate and overall be a lot more smooth. Another thing is that since the, this is going to be kind of like the Blizzard endorsed OQ, it's essentially installed in every single World of Warcraft player's client. That means the user base for the group finder is going to be ginormous, so it really is just going to be so easy to get into a flex group. It will be fantastic. Now there is one issue though, people may start asking for higher and higher item levels to get in, and honestly the best way to get around this is for the kind of people who are rejected to just band together and do their own runs. Back in Wrath of the Lich King, we had the whole gear score epidemic, and honestly, it was absurd. Now, I did actually manage to lead a few moderately successful Try of the Crusader pugs um, that didn't really, uh, just basically made up of people who didn't have enough gear score, and what I, I'd say really just through solid kind of leadership and actually just being nice to people and talking problems through, we were able to succeed quite a bit, and that was what got me the gear score that I needed to be widely accepted into groups. However, though, I don't think it's going to be as big a problem. There are so many 
uh, sources of gear in this game that will increase item level. And Blizzard have confirmed that with their group finder, the one thing that, um, like, for an example, people will be able to gate entries via, say, item level. So maybe you can't join this group if your item level is below a certain number. The thing is, though, there are going to be so many ways to increase your item level. We have dungeons, fine. We have the end game PvE content. We have garrisons. We have LFR mode. And we have just so many different things. And this will help us to increase our item level without raiding. And that should be enough to get people into raids. If they balance the gear checks and stuff like that for earlier bosses well enough, then the gear score epi epidemic just will not happen. And that's kind of fantastic. And one or two other points, and um, one of the great things about this group finder system is that you can go in and probably I'd say within 5 to 10 minutes have a group. That is far faster than most LFR runs, and if you wanted to say um, flex through group finder, you can get into one group that could do three wings, and that might take you two hours, right? Maybe three. Well, the comparison for LFR would be two 30 minute waits and then two very slow clears because people in LFR generally there just tends to be a lot more problems, right? Now, another point that I have on LFR, and this is actually something that I only really thought of a few days ago, but LFR encounter design is a bit weird at the minute because they basically take, like, they take a full-on raid encounter from normal and then they just nerf the fuck out of the numbers, right? Now, that's fine in principle, and it does make fights that are easy. They're not particularly hard. I'll, I'll give everyone that. That's, that's true. But I think the problem is that the... A lot of fun comes from difficulty, and the difficulty doesn't come from the fight's mechanics because the mechanics themselves have been so heavily compromised by the way in which they nerfed them. That's a big sentence, isn't it? So essentially, I would have, instead of, so there's a boss which has, say, six relatively intricate abilities that all sort of intertwine with each other, maybe they just have the LFR version of that fight, have half the abilities, and then just have those particular abilities matter a little bit more. So that way players still get that whole sense of risk and, um, you know, them actually succeeding as players being a part of why the group as a whole succeeds. They still get that feeling and they don't have bosses that are completely trivialized in terms of mechanics. So maybe they make it so that, yeah, you still, you really, you don't stand in the fire, but as long as you do that, maybe there's not as many other things to worry about. Because for a lot of people that jump into flex, they're not really people who care about raiding in a giant capacity. So for them, the amount of visual noise, and visual noise is a concept where basically, if your brain is presented with uh, just a wide amount of data at once, and it's not really trained in how to deal with that data, then your brain is going to get very confused and just it's just going to kind of sit there and fail, right? So that's probably what happens for a lot of unskilled players. They jump in and they, they see the fire under them, they see all the spells flying everywhere, they see the boss doing five different kinds of abilities, and it's just confusing. Well, if you boil that down to two or three, then I think you're going to have LFR where there is still... Like, I'm not going to say difficulty because it would be easy, but there are still consequences, and more meaningful consequences than there are, say, at the minute. Um, in that, if you stand in a fire, well, you're not really going to do too well. Um, but there's not going to be so many confusing mechanics and things like that that you are not going to remember to stand in the fire. It sounds weird to me saying that, actually, just even sounds weird to myself, because, like, I'm an experienced raider, I never stand in the fire. But I suppose I just have to remember that there's a wide spectrum of people who play the game with different interests that are not mine. But anyway, basically, my what I want is for LFR to be as good as it possibly can be for its target audience because that means that target audience is happy. And as a like a responsible player or a responsible human being, I kind of want other people to be happy. So yeah, flex. I just or not flex. Sorry, LFR. I just don't think it's been well designed around. Um, now, there have been one or two indications from Blizzard that they are going to take a little bit more stock in how they balance and design LFR versions of encounters, so I think that really is quite good. Next of all, uh, dungeons, they will be better. So, they, um, they are going to be having both max level normal mode dungeons and then max level heroic mode dungeons. Unlike in Mesa Pandaria, where there was just one level um, at max level, and it was just heroics, right? Now, this means that at level 100, there's essentially an additional tier of gear with dungeons. They said that this will allow them to make heroic dungeons a little bit harder, because um, right now, they are just extremely easy, basically, and f too easy. Now, they're not going to make them as hard as they were in Cataclysm, because in Cataclysm, while the uh, while they were really fantastic for normal groups of just um, a group of friends or a guild, 
the problem was it just did not work in matchmaking. And personally, I, I just wish that um, more people rise to the challenge, but sadly, maybe this is just a part of the human condition. Many Puggies would just rage quit, which would leave the players who did care and did put the effort in high and dry, and that was just a bad gameplay experience. So I think that this system should be a little bit better. And then, of course, we will get more dungeons. They have expressed that they do want to add dungeons in content patches. However, they are a little bit worried about funneling people into, like, the one or two new dungeons that came out. The good example of this is in, say, Cataclysm when the two troll dungeons came out, but the problem is they invalidated all of the previous dungeons. So this one is actually a little bit harder to sort out. First of all, I think they will need to keep a steady stream of new ones coming, and secondly, they will need to make sure that they don't make the old stuff 100% irrelevant. Being forced into the same three dungeons for days and days on end will just get old very fast. They should be adding new dungeons while just trying to find a way to still have a sort of decent sized pool of dungeons that are at that increased item level. I think that they should perhaps have the lower tier of older dungeons and then perhaps have newer dungeons be in a slightly higher tier. Perhaps say the same level of gear that was fulfilled by Battlefield Barons, Heroic Scenarios or the Timeless Isle and then any new dungeons just keep on being added to the tier of new dungeons. That's just one idea, and honestly, I don't think it's a perfect one, but I think it's something that does warrant more discussion. Anyway, it's hard to balance right, and of course, Blizzard, I'm sure, would be able to find a good way of doing it, I think. Then, of course, scenarios are still a thing. Um, I think the regular ones are really just going to be there to fill out gear spots for people who have just dinged. Heroic scenarios are very strange. Because, you see, in Mists of Pandaria, they completely undercut heroic uh, dungeons by quite a bit. And we just don't know how this is going to work out in Warlords of Draenor. Personally, I would have heroic scenarios be somewhere in between a normal raid and a heroic dungeon in terms of both... Well, just in terms of everything. I think that's probably the best place to put it in. Because the dungeon is something that's iconic. Going into a place with your friends, killing the dude, getting the loot. But... It's still a level where there's a nice bit of scale and some mechanical complexity. I just think that it was really sad how heroic scenarios completely undercut that in a way that, okay, may have had some more numerical difficulty, but mechanically, there really wasn't much in it. And then next, PvP will be far, far better. First of all, the competitive people will have this new system called Trial of the Gladiator. It's got normalized gear and a skill-only approach. The way that works is that essentially... Every few days, or I think, no, it's not every few days, it's um, a certain time at every day, like a certain bracket of time, Trial of the Gladiator will be open for, I think, ratings to matter. And essentially in that period, your ratings will matter and Blizzard will be able to monitor that to prevent things like win trading and all that bad stuff. So it's going to be this really cool skill-only approach, which will have some nice prestige war rewards and an ELO system and that whole thing. Then there are also regular arenas, which will essentially be as they are, then battlegrounds and rated battlegrounds. And then there's Ashran. It's this massive open PvP zone with a ton of dynamic mechanics. And these are, um, there's going to be like multiple bases for each faction, multiple different kinds of vehicles, uh, many different kinds of objectives, and it's all going to be persistent. At BlizzCon, they did say they were talking about it being sort of akin to old school Al Alteric Valley. Um, backward matches could take over 6 to 10 hours, um, and that was really a truly epic experience. So it would be very nice for Ashran to be a little bit like that. And then next, more dynamic content and less dailies. So they are wanting to go with less daily quests and more Timeless Isle style of things. Now I think this is really great and dailies get old very quick, so it's definitely the right design choice. And then just having the choice, well their whole solution involved having a choice between maybe, oh you can do this daily hub or this daily hub. And as we know from patch 5.0 and the start of Pandaria, that just doesn't work. So while I think here the main problem was actually not dailies themselves, it's just how they were done in MOP, and that was inherently more problematic. Basically, asking people to get on this like really ultra bespoke treadmill is not really going to work out for that long, because people knew with dailies, here are the rewards, you will need to do these quests for X amount of days, and there are five different reps to get. That burnt people out, and that's really the, the problem. If there was just one or two sets of dailies and they were smaller or perhaps better done, then I don't think we would have the current situation where everyone is just yelling about dailies and being angry, but I think they really just killed dailies when they did that. Now, Draenor is going to be full of lots of cool stuff for both leveling and then the end game solo PvE, and I'd imagine that there will be a lot more kind of heavily designed zones and areas. Um, what I mean by heavily designed is um, 
basically a lot of these like cool mechanics like finding treasures and dynamic events they're really going to be well ingrained into the actual design of the zone and that's actually going to t tie in with the fact that you cannot fly in patch until patch 6.1 so a lot of the world will feel more alive and the end game pve will be far more relevant hopefully a lot more engaging they also do need a little bit more structure than the Isle, though. I think people did blow through the, the Timeless Isle really quickly, just due to how it was designed. And uh, also, I think zones would have to be larger than the Isle. Uh, still, although, I think that similar, similarly styled content in the future will get better and better, to the point where the Isle just looks shit in comparison. And honestly, the Timeless Isle was really just the test bed in comparison. Well, like, um, yeah. It was just more of a test bed than anything else. So... Yeah, anyway, next thing, faster patch cycles. The team is getting larger at Blizzard. And right now, there are, uh, there are, sorry, has, bar the post-patch 5.4 period, been a patch every three months. And I feel this is actually quite nice in terms of pace. However, they could do more. And I'd say they should do stuff like little tiny patches from time to time that just kind of give you more elements of a story. So kind of like quest patches in between the sort of 5.1 and 5.3 style patches. Even the stuff like just adding new dynamic events, uh, maybe a lore quest line that leads up to the next patch. Essentially things that will keep the player base engaged on a month to month basis. I think ideally a monthly patch that would do something cool would be absolutely fantastic and I'd be really just happy with that. And then finally with the things that we know are coming we have garrisons. These seem like a whole game of themselves actually which is kind of great. And there will be stuff there for raiders, PvPers, and basically just everyone. It's a system that will kind of, it will have some area of it that's relevant to everyone that plays the game. So there is content there for the whole lot of us. And then it's also a system that can be added to and expanded upon as this expansion goes on. And this is really the big new feature in the expansion, I guess. And I think it's going to do a great job of keeping people interested. I do, however, wonder, though, how long it's going to take to get level 3 or garrison. And then after your garrison is leveled up, how much of an, like, um, an incentive is there to keep on going? Anyway, so that's really the stuff that we know about Warlords of Draenor. Let's spend a little bit of time just talking about one or two things, which I think they should really be adding in in the expansion that will help us out. So first of all, we have Mythic Dungeons. Now, this is an idea of mine which really combines the best of multiple kind of dungeon systems. So I'm sure many of you from the Cataclysm era who are in guilds remember really enjoying the heroics. So why not have heroic dungeon level or Cataclysm heroic level dungeon difficulty in Warlords of Draenor? But instead of just sort of shoehorning it into this matchmate thing, let's just have mythic dungeons. We already have mythic raids where the uh, expectation of mythic means significantly harder than the other difficulty levels. Why just not have that? I think it would be fantastic because it would give gilded players I suppose a far more fulfilling option in terms of play, but also, and I think more importantly, for the solo player, or not, not sorry, not the solo player, but the, the kind of max level player who's in a guild, but doesn't really have the time to commit to, say, a three hour raid three, two times a week. And that is a lot of people, because nine hours is a lot of time out of anyone's week, let's be honest. So for these people, you can still do Mythic Dungeons as a form of really fulfilling and challenging end game content. Now, a lot of people are probably going to say, well, hey, we have challenge dungeons already. Well, here's the thing about challenge. First of all, it's a time trial. And some people would rather do the sort of slow, methodical, really plan out your maneuvers kind of thing. And just not uh, not really wanting the stress of the time. And I actually agree with that. And I think that's totally fine. So that's one way in which challenge modes doesn't cater to this. Another way is that there's no gear progression at all. Like, it just normalizes everyone's gear. So, um, in terms of progression... I guess there's uh, there's far less of a carrot there for people, and in MMOs, people do like the carrot. Uh, so, yeah, then of course it also just avoids the whole problem of the stuff being too hard, and then because there's the whole matchmaking system with LFD, they need to nerf it, and they just nerf it by doing like a flat 20% nerf. Then that makes all the mechanics of the encounters just kind of broken and janky, therefore it's not fun for everyone. So I think, yeah, go do Mythic. Now, another question about Mythic... Uh, dungeons would be what kind of item level do you put it at and honestly i don't have a full-on solution i would put it at perhaps maybe slightly under flexible raids but only slightly or maybe the same as flex actually no no i'd say slightly under flexible raids hell for those people who are trying to do group finder um 
Yeah, who are try trying to do a group finder group for flex. Maybe you find, oh, damn, I just... I just can't get a high enough item level to get into this flex group. Maybe Mythic Dungeons could be your solution. Now, unfortunately, as much as I love this feature, and it's actually one that I came up with about three months ago, I think, as much as I'd love this to be there, there is absolutely no indication that it will be, and I think that really is a missed opportunity. At least we can kind of console ourselves in the fact that the, uh, the baseline heroics will at least be a little bit more difficult. Anyway, so LFR improvement. Now, I will gloss over this because I kind of talked a little bit about it above, but essentially, having LFR, instead of having the whole bunch of crazy amount of mechanics, etc., as I said earlier, it's taken down to two or three mechanics that are quite readable, but also require a tiny bit more attention. And that, that way, you actually have it so everyone running through LFR understands the fight, they kind of get an idea, and what's, I think, more important is that it actually boils that raid experience down into this kind of, okay, let's be honest, an easy format that still sort of matters. So that would be kind of nice, and it means that for this tourist mode, as Blizzard have been calling it recently, there is at least some gameplay value there, instead of just having a few hours of your life wasted with idiots running into fires and just all the kind of... Me like mechanical um, cluster that there is and it's not really intelligent cluster because of the way LFR is currently nerfed down uh, So that's one thing and now also if there, if there was just three or four mechanics what could literally happen right is When uh, when the LFR group goes up before the boss and you know, they're ready to pull There's just a little UI element pops up and says by the way. Here's this boss here are the few things that he does, and um, here's a little bit of an example, or whatever, so that people can actually understand what's going on in the boss fight, they appreciate it, and they have a little bit more fun. Yeah, this is not something that's going to appeal to a lot of you guys, but honestly, for the people who would say that my implementation of LFR is too easy, then LFR is not... I, I actually think that flex suits you far better, and since flex is something that you will be able to jump into at any point because of the group finder, then it's not really an issue in Warlords, and that's kind of great. Then next, we have a monthly 5.1 style storyline quest. Now, this is probably not going to happen because of development time, but I'd say in the expansion after Warlords, this is probably uh, definitely something that could happen. Now, the 5.1 storyline quests were actually something that a lot of people enjoyed. Of course, people didn't really like the daily hub bullshit that was going on in 5.1. At least that quest was engaging. And one of the cool things about that quest as well was the fact that it only unlocked once every few days. Now what, I think from a MMO design uh, point of view, that kind of kept a little hook every day for people to go in and check and uh, you could have a series of 10 quests that actually lasts two or three weeks. That, just having that every single month could work quite well. Now. Uh, I think actually a really good example of this is Spartan Ops in Halo 4, and I know a lot of you guys don't play Halo 4, and honestly I don't either, but I played a little bit at launch with some friends at university, it was good fun actually, really fun game. Anyway, it had this system called Spartan Ops, and these were a series of five missions, and actually the missions themselves were really rudimentary, but I think, uh, yeah, it was like a new set of missions would come out every two weeks, or whatever, and they would be accompanied by a new story cinematic, and they just have a new wad of story to them. Now this was cool, because every two weeks you would go back to Halo and you'd know, oh yay, there's like a new cool story thing waiting for me. So that's, that's, it, like it worked out like that in an FPS. And FPSs are generally something where there's not a terrible amount of persistence in terms of gameplay from match to match, you know, other than all, unlocking the odd gun or something. But in World of Warcraft, there's a lot of persistence, right? So if you have um, this 5.1 style storyline quest thingy that's being updated every single month that essentially is a continuous thing, now, this does a lot of great things. First of all, it means that players can actually be really invested in a story. If they do it right, not too much hand-holding, but if they actually do this right, they can really invest players in the story of the expansion, make things more relevant, and when your players are more invested in the story, they're going to take a little bit more out of the environments they're in and uh, the gameplay mechanics that they're involved with. So if you know the story behind Garrosh, there's a good chance you'll appreciate Siege Vorgrimmar a little bit more. A similar effect could, could happen with these 5.1 style storyline quests. In fact, I think it's kind of unfortunate that 5.3 didn't have that to a greater degree. So yeah, that would be cool. In terms of rewards, I'm not really sure. I guess you would have to do some sort of reward. Um, maybe they could kind of roll this all into the legendary quest for the expansion, where the legendary quest is actually something that's constantly updated, and uh, it doesn't really rely on ultra-heavy RNG-style things like the Rathian one did. Honestly, I think the Rathian one... 
Uh, like, uh, personally, you know, game design is something that's very important to me. Uh, the main course that I'm doing at university is more to do with game programming, but of course design really is a very integral element of the whole process of making a game. So, I think that, I, like, I, I kind of see a lot of issues with the way they handle the legendary quest line, and that really is kind of shitty and unfortunate. Then there are class quests, and really class quests are the sort of thing that are just very fun for those specific classes. Now that's fine, and I guess they do take up quite a lot of resources to make. Still though, I think it is actually worth pursuing it. The Warlock class quest seems to be just a complete success. In the both Blizzard and even just most of the Warlocks that I know, I mean, in general, it just seems like it was a real highlight of the expansion for a lot of people. So if they could bring this to as many classes as possible while still having them feel like they work out in terms of the context of the expansion and the class's lore. So not things that are just kind of foamed in or phoned in, whatever, and just kind of random, but at least stuff that sort of makes sense. Like the Warlock Green Fire quest, it did make sense within Warlock lore. So if they can do more things like that, I think it would be quite great. It's also a way of providing more meaningful and relatively challenging end-game gameplay that's like outside the usual instant stuff. I think World of Warcraft does have a bit of a tendency of just locking content inside an instance behind a loading screen, and that's a bit of a problem. I remember there being some cool quests like the, the old Seer quest, and some various things like that in Mists, and I think if they just had a great deal more things like that, it would give a little bit more longevity into the end game, and just the regular people who don't raid all the time will have more content to do. Now another cool thing about the class quest is that it actually allows them to do some very cool things in terms of rewards. You can actually have class specific um, like a class-specific legendary or class-specific loot item at the end, something that feels really special to players of that class, and something that's at least hard enough to obtain that it does feel like an epic reward. Not just something like the epic cloak, which is got by getting some random items and then killing a kitten, uh, a spectral kitten, which has like 70 million HP that's easy. That wasn't too epic, but I think if they just tie something in with a class quest, it could be really cool. For an example, as a hunter, maybe you can get a really badass bow. Uh, maybe, I don't know, mages can get a cool hat, or something that just fits the class, and at least maybe has some lore behind it. Perhaps when, like in Draenor, it's a whole new planet. Maybe there are some heirloom, when I say heirloom weapons, I mean more kind of like legendary weapons of that era in time. So maybe the bow of some really awesome orc who was a great hunter. That kind of thing. I think that would be a very good way to do it, and it would just be kind of meaningful and fun. Another thing that's worth mentioning about these class quests is that, and this really is one of the special things that's unique to class quests, they can actually design the quest mechanics and the encounter mechanics specifically around the class which the quest is designed for. So that means you will get to use the full breadth of your shaman abilities or your hunter abilities, and that just means that it really is far more engaging gameplay. I think, um, in specific, like, we'll definitely get a, a shaman uh, quest, and the reason I think we'll get a shaman one is because the original shamans were orcs, orcs come from Draenor, a lot of shamanism takes place in Draenor, therefore, it makes complete sense that shamans will get one. In terms of other classes, I'm not specifically really that sure. I mean, they, they could definitely fit things in for a lot of different classes, given what's going on. I think a hunter can make sense because the place is all sort of primal and bestial. Maybe it involves you and Helmut Nezingwery going off and killing some of the most badass giant creatures of the time, um, and just general things like that. Maybe for warriors it's some sort of orcish honor based thing. They really could do a lot with this. Anyway, so now that we're done with that, the next thing I think would really help out is a multiple raid per tier Northrend style, um, well, uh, Nor Northrend uh, launch style kind of raid setup. Now when you launched into Northrend, you had Naxxramas, you had Sartharian's Lair, um, and you had the Oculus. Now what was really cool about this, first of all, Naxxramas I didn't really enjoy in the Oculus, yeah, it had that vehicle problem, which was definitely a well, problem, but what this did was it gave you a very significant break in scenery, right? Because all, of, like, the three of these places looked very different. And that's really important. So right now what they're going to have in Warlords is High Mall and uh, some Blackrock place. Essentially it's two 6 to 8 dungeon raids, or 6 to 8 uh, boss raids. Now that's fine, but I think these little 1 or 2 boss raids are actually something that they kind of have lost a little bit in World of Warcraft. And especially also for the more casual player, and let's be honest, 
while I think they are actually doing a good job of catering to the more hardcore people with raiding, and I'm really enjoying the mechanical complexity of fights at the minute, but I do think for the casual player, there is definitely some value in being able to hop into a Pug Sartharian, go in and get your weekly kill. Something that actually I used to do way back in the day was every single week I go in and I do my Sartharian or I do my Anixia run or something like that and that's just not cared for anymore and that was a great reason to log into the game and do something that was fun every week. Why don't they have that? Now another issue is that say in Throne of Thunder or Siege of Orgrimmar, right? You're in the same aesthetic setting, you're in the same place for the whole tier of six months bit of an issue there. Sometimes it's nice to be able to jump off to that random dragon in the hole somewhere and kill it instead. If you just don't feel like going back to that same place that you've been grinding through. I think especially um, Throne of Thunder got extremely just kind of wearing in me. It's, it's weird, like I really enjoyed the fights, but the whole just place itself, it just kind of crushed me down over time. And that was because there was no reprieve from it. If that place had have been, say, uh, I don't know, 10 bosses, and there was maybe another two-boss instance somewhere else, like a two-boss raid, that was aesthetically different, and in terms of lore, story-wise, was a bit different, I think then that would have just kept, uh, just kept me interested in Endgame for a little bit longer. So I think that would be nice. Of course, from the art department, it is a lot more work, because they would have to do art for two raids, and then the encounter design people... I guess it wouldn't be more work for them because they're still doing the same amount of bosses, but I guess you know what I mean, it would be a bit more workload, but that is not really an excuse when you're World of Warcraft and you're bringing in that money. It, it should never be an excuse. And that said, as long as they keep on hiring at a rate which still ensures good quality, of course. Anyway, so that's one thing, and then the second, um, another raid-related suggestion is more open-ended raids. And this is something that they haven't had in a while. And that's really a pity. There's one part of Siege of Orgrimmar where it's a tiny bit open-ended. But I mean, say, like in um, Ice Crown Citadel, where you could there was three different wings to choose from. You could do whichever one you wanted. That was cool. That actually meant that with your raid team, you could go into that place and do a different boss. Um, you could go into three raids and do a different wing every night. And that would really keep things nice and split up. And it was just fun. You could do what your raiders actually felt like doing. Now, compare that to Throne of Thunder, where, oh, you, you want to do Consorts? Well, tough shit, you need to do every single boss before it. Now, it said Consorts was a shit fight, so I don't, know, don't really know why I'd want to do it, but the point still stands. If you had have maybe done the first four bosses of Throne of Thunder, and then it split up into a few wings, and then finally converged for Lei Shen, I think that would have been way more engaging, and people wouldn't have just been grinded down. An element of game design which is often talked about is that it's important to keep mechanics and things like that sort of similar. And I mean mechanics as in you have MMO combat, you fight boss, etc. Not actual class mechanics and fight mechanics. But you want to keep the general gameplay the same, but while offering new patterns to players. Because our, we get very bored when we carry out the same pattern again and again and again and again. That's why we kind of moved away from having rotations and moved more into priority systems and reactive procs. This is also one of the reasons why it's actually a good bit more fun if you have a less linear raid because you can choose a new pattern every night. This is just talking from a strict game design perspective, but I definitely wager that people would be burnt out a little bit slower if uh, the raids were more open-ended and less linear. And then finally, I'm just going to say Proving Grounds at lower levels slash having a Proving Grounds style thing at the level 90 boost. Proving Grounds at max level are kind of pointless because often the people who get to max level are the very people who know how to play the game. Or at least know their class. Of course, every idiot you've ever met in LFR is contrary to that, but in general, you kind of know what I mean. So yeah, I think that they should really be doing Proving Grounds at lower levels and things like that because... That means that when people level up, say you're a tank, right, and or you're, you're a warrior, and you get this ability called Taunt, and while you're leveling, Taunt is never really that useful to you, so you just stick it away and you never really think about it again. Then you hit Endgame and you hear about this thing called Tanking and Taunting and what, and you're really confused. Well, if a Proving Ground has given you the context of what a Taunt is at a low level, then as you level up and gain more abilities and things like that, you actually start to appreciate your abilities more, and then you understand them more, which means that when you actually hit max level, you should integrate a little bit better in. So there's that, and then also I think you should just be there in the level 90 boost area, because it would be nice for people who are just doing a new class, and because of the boost, they're still not really sure exactly how to play it. It would be nice to give them a little bit of a test bed. 
So yeah, that's that's really it in terms of my discussion of how I think Worlds of Draenor is going to help. There are certainly um, other options and different things um, floating about the place. But uh, yeah, really, I think just to recap for the video, first 15 minutes, just the reasons why Warlords is going to help based on what they've said. Last 15 somethings I think Blizzard could really uh, sort of implement in Warlords or beyond that would help. And um, yeah, I really, I hope you enjoyed it. I am actually going to do a third part of this video of just kind of how to help WoW in general. And I'll be talking a little bit more about business practices and that. So price points, subscription models, and just more, um, I, perhaps just better ways to get people into the game and that sort of thing. But anyway, until then, if you have any suggestions or you have any, like any reasons uh, that you think Worlds will help or any suggestions that you can say about maybe a new gameplay mechanic or a new difficulty or something like that, please leave them down in the comments because um, just the more that we all learn from each other, then the better everything ends up being. So on that remarkably cheesy note, thank you very much for watching. Please drop a like if you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.